Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, tuning in and listening. Today, we're going to be talking to Dale L. Roberts from Columbus, Ohio. Dale, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hey. Uh, well, shoot. Uh, I think that you pretty much covered it. I'm Dale L. Roberts. Uh, I am a avid shuffleboard enthusiast, uh, self-published author, number one best-selling, uh, internationally speaking, and uh, I'm definitely not the Batman. <laughs> All right. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for. Uh, Thanks for tuning in with us today, Dale. So yeah. uh, I guess let's jump right into it. The first question I have for you today is, what is your story? Wow. Oh, man. Uh, this this might cover about an hour here, so hopefully you got some time. Please. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'm actually one of three children in a military family. My mother was in the Navy. My father was in the Marine Corps. Uh, growing up, it was primarily my father uh, who was in the military because my mother had already been out of the service by the time I was already born. Um, I was able to travel the, the world at a very young age. I, I believe I lived a very privileged life. So there was many experiences that I got at a very early age that not anybody could probably get the rest of their life. But uh, I'd always really, I've been a bit, when I was growing up, I was an introvert and I loved reading. That was one thing that I just absolutely, I could just, that was my escape. I would just sit and I would read, play video games, of course, but I mean, what kid doesn't play video games? Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually got to the point where I enjoyed reading so much that I started creating my own stories. So you fast forward some time later as I was going through school, I decided that was going to be what I was going to go to college for, was become a writer. And uh, I had my mindset on becoming a writer for Guitar World magazine. Never came to fruition because I got to college and I just discovered really quickly that writing is not for sissies. I'm telling you what, man. And especially if you're going to school specifically for that. I mean, my very first class, I think uh, our first paper that was handed in, I think I got an F. They pretty much, this guy was like, you know, you have no focus. Everything's all over the place. You've got bad grammar, syntax, everything else in between. And I pretty much, you know, tail tucked, you know, ran off and... Uh, Thankfully, my aunt had helped me out and really cleaned up things, and I was able to go through about two semesters and really do pretty well at college because of her. Um, But I just eventually just kind of lost sight of things, became very defeated, and I got into a heavy metal band. And uh, that's when I really started, you know, just focusing on just music, music, music. When I get on something, I really focus and I get very obsessive on it. And we became mildly successful. We were able to get all over just the Midwest area made a little bit of scratch on the side part-time. Meanwhile, I worked as an activities director in the healthcare industry. So essentially, I got paid to play with senior citizens. And um, let's you know, chop this up here, hopefully, because you know I'll just be bloviating after a while. Um, I fell in love with professional wrestling. 1999, August 1999. I just happened to be flipping through the channels, and I got hooked. And mind you, as a kid, I was always told it was the F word. It was fake. And so I just never paid attention to it. It wasn't until my adult life that I actually started watching it and I became hooked. And that's when I became so obsessive about watching it. And of course, watching it, I saw all these athletes and I wanted to be just like them. So that's why I started to really gravitate towards health and fitness, getting myself in better shape, getting rid of this little pot belly that I got from over the years of drinking alcohol and everything else in between. And that's when I went to, eventually, uh, I went to some crappy local gym to get trained in professional wrestling. And I took it so seriously that eventually I ended up getting a tryout with other WWF at the time, WWE now, uh, people um, over in Louisville, Kentucky. And that's when I said, okay, this is it. This is great. But um, I eventually said, okay, if I'm going to take this really seriously, because WWF wasn't interested in hiring me because I was, shoot, I didn't know my ass from a hole in the ground. So I ended up going over to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I trained underneath Lance Storm, former WWE superstar, multiple title holder, things like that. And I got into wrestling. I promise you, I'm getting to the end of this story here. So this this, this, this does get better, and it does lead up to what I'm going to talk about, and that is... Eventually, I got a serious injury. It screwed my back up. I went from being a solid 220, muscled out and everything else like that, to shriveling down to about 175, where I'm right about 175, 180 right now. And that back injury really screwed me up, and I I had to get out of wrestling. 
And I stuck around doing the work and activities all that time. I spent 20 years in the healthcare industry, but in the back of my mind, writing kept nagging at me. And that's where uh, I finally got a little bit of coaxing from some people. And I actually wrote my very first book actually about three years ago. And the funny thing is, is it made me some money. And that's where pretty much self-publishing comes into play. When I started realizing it can make me money, that's when I realized, well, do I really need a day job? Now, this is something I tell everybody, don't do what I did. I literally burned the boats a little too soon. Uh, thankfully, my wife was running a very good Amazon FBA business, um, and we were making a significant amount of income on that. But other than that, though, the self-publishing, I bailed on you know my job pretty much to get $20 paychecks per month, you know, up to $200 paychecks. So you can only imagine how tough it was for a while. And, um, you know, we really, uh, we really struggled for a while. I got used to eating ramen noodles. Right. And it wasn't until actually I looked into getting a actual self-publishing course through Jason Brock and also further mentoring with him. I got coaching through him that I was able to take my business from down here at a low level to functioning at a much higher level. And uh, I'll tell you what, he blew my mind and he really expanded the business and got to me to where I am today. So that's my story. Now that we're out of time, thank you everybody for tuning in. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, that's great. <laughs> so um, I just have a few questions kind of about your, uh, your past. Okay. Um, so you said you, you grew up with a military family uh, on, on yeah. both sides. Um, do you think growing up in, in that sort of household um, kind of implanted certain values in you that have helped you succeed? And if so, what, what values were they? Absolutely. Um, I was in a bit of a different military situation. So sometimes people will say, well, I was in a military family. So you almost get this picture of like a drill sergeant father with a crew cut that would be very demanding, you know, sit up straight, answer, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. To a certain extent, yeah, we were very uh, disciplined but to a certain extent, I think that it was really my mother was the disciplinarian. My father, being the Marine Corps, you would think he would have been the drill sergeant type person. But actually, he was the person I got my sense of humor from. He's the cut up. He's the joker. Always, you know, has something funny. He I, rarely ever in a bad mood. Everybody loved Mike Roberts. So I learned how to be professional. But in the same instance, I learned how to be fun. Uh, right. So it was the mixture of both parents. Um, their undying work ethic, that was one thing they really passed down to me where it was, you know, uh, it was never anything they ever said to me. It was just kind of led by example. When you work on something, you put your heart into it, whether you're scrubbing a toilet or you're serving a burger to somebody at McDonald's or if you were, you know, just any line of work, you should take pride in it because it represents who you are as a person. So that's why I do what I do with all the heart and all the passion and every bit of energy inside my soul is put into what I do. So yeah, that's, that's really, I, I think I was very fortunate and it really does play a large part in how I'm able to do my business, how I do function on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that answered your question. I'm not really 100% sure that's what you were looking for. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, you, you said uh, a little bit after you're talking about your family how you got to travel, um, and you got to you got to see a lot of different things, um, and you got to be exposed to different cultures. Um, do you think that because of your travels, you have a better perspective on both yourself and life in general from those travels? Absolutely. Being exposed to numerous cultures and different portions in the United States, uh, living in Japan for three years uh, when I was 10 to 13 years old was an amazing experience. I mean, I really, that was, I, I don't think I could trade that for the world. It was one of the best portions of my life. Of course, I say that a lot about my portions of life, but that right there was the most memorable because it was such a beautiful country and such a wonderful culture over in Japan. Um, but yeah, I think that really helped to mold me and make me probably a little bit more mature at a younger age. And do you think that, um, you know, be, because you got to travel that 
Uh, it helped you get more comfortable talking to other people, and, and you, you kind of learned how to be comfortable even when you're uncomfortable. Do you think that plays a part of your success? That could be a, a large part of it, but the, the funny thing is I probably didn't start developing into more of an extrovert until I was uh, later into high school. We were already, uh, my father was uh, already um, had a had an honorable discharge in 1989, so we moved to Ohio in Attica, small, small town. My, my grandma lived there, uh, my aunt and her family had lived out there, my uncle lived nearby. So Ohio was a good fit for the Roberts family, and we ended up settling down once when he was out of the military. So when I went to high school, that's pretty much where I picked up, and we'd moved up from Japan in 89 over to the middle of nowhere in Attica, Ohio. That's, that's really, um, I'm bloviating, I can tell already. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, this, this is great, I run into this problem, I'm bootstrap businessman. Uh, what was the question again, I'm sorry? So when, uh, you know, when you were traveling um, and you were getting to talk to different people. Um, yeah. Oh, extrovert. Right. Yes. Right. Didn't become an extrovert until I was in high school. Uh, it took a while for me to open up. I became good at speaking, believe it or not, because I was doing a, a gig called Voice of Democracy in high school. And it was because of the urging of my social studies teacher, uh, who's now since passed. His name was Mr. Brenneman. And uh, he took me aside and he just told me, you know, he really kind of fluffed my ego where he's just like, I really see there's a lot of promise in you. I think you should do this. And he said the thing that most interested me wasn't the fact that I could be able to talk, you know, patriotically about my country, but it was the prize money that was involved. He was just like, you know, there's going to be, I can't remember, probably it was like $50 if right, I would have right. won the contest. And I was like, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very uncomfortable at first. Yes, I will admit to you. Like, I'm shaking. I'm nervous. Uh, and I don't think I shook that feeling. Even going into a rock band and being in front of people, I was always just, I'd get the jitters. Fast forward some time later, though, when I got into pro wrestling, I had no issues in getting in front of an audience. Someone would hand me a microphone, and it was like a trigger. And I would just, all of a sudden, I just felt like, you know, nerves would go completely away. The funny thing is you could sit me down with one person, one-on-one, -on -one, and sometimes they'll get nervous. I don't know what the deal is, but you put me in front of a group of hundreds of people, and I'm at peace. So I'm not really sure. It could be years of working with senior citizens hosting parties, major events, things like that, to where it was in my mindset that, you know, well, they don't pay me to be nervous. So right. <laughs> I just eventually just, I got rid of a lot of those inhibitions, those things in the back of my head that I think they call it like a monkey mindset to where it's just like, you're not good enough to talk, you know, and I just eventually got in front of people and I felt comfortable. Man, I'm so glad you rescued me on that question right there. I just I started going off on a tangent there, and I think it's time to re up on my coffee, man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I kind of want to I kind of want to talk about your uh, your days in the heavy metal um, band scene. Um, okay. So first of all, what did you play, um, and and what did you really get out of it? What was your what was your biggest uh, value that you got from from being in that? I played a lead guitar primarily. Uh, I usually butchered up most lead <laughs> guitar, <laughs> guitar things. Uh, I eventually got into actually singing slash screaming in a band since it was a metal band. Um, the biggest thing that I got from it was I learned that I put the bar way too high on the people I surrounded myself with because I expected a lot of myself. So what I would end up doing was I became a bit of a dictator, a bit of a control freak. And sometimes uh, you, you become friends with the people that you're inside this band, but it really alienated me from people that I considered friends. And I, I really ruined quite a few friendships from that control freak type um, nature I had. So it actually started to teach me that, you know, sure, you can hold people at a high expectation. But you gotta also make sure that they know that those expectations are set and they agree to those expectations. So uh, as an example, I mean, uh, gosh, had had a bass player, man, he, he, was, he was my best buddy. We ended up, we were actually roommates for a number of years and 
come to find out he was, you know, he was doing some drugs he shouldn't have been doing. Mm -hmm. um, and we're not talking like smoking pot. I mean, we're talking like the hardcore stuff. And I confronted him on it. And the, you know, the issue I ran into was um, I told him once. Okay, great. Second time happens and I confronted him again. And that time he said, look, promise won't do it again. But unfortunately, I felt like it was too little too late at that point. And I was influenced in a way by the drummer that, hey, look, you already put that out there. And I ended up firing him. And it literally destroyed a friendship. I mean, uh, it's it's one thing if a person was an addict and then they were stealing from us or doing things wrong. But at this point, he was just recreationally abusing drugs. So um, and abusing not like, you know, he was you know snorting rails off of hookers, you know, or anything else like that, but uh, it was it was enough that it it was, in my opinion, something that could really endanger his life, which in turn means that we'd have to fill his position. So we just said, "Screw it, you're out of here," and it really sucks. Uh, so that was one of the biggest things I learned was, you know, don't just secretly set expectations for people that you surround yourself with. You need to be very vocal, and you need to be straightforward and upfront, and also be very tactful about your expectations and you got to make sure that they agree to those expectations because just because you have those doesn't necessarily mean they agree with them. Right. That's a really good point. Um, so, you know, kind of kind of moving uh, a little bit chronologically past the, the band scene, mm -hmm. um, you know, you said at some point um, you kept feeling this, this nagging, this intuition for writing. Um, what was kind of the tipping point that you said, okay, I'm going to start writing now, and do you wish you would have started sooner? Well, first of all, yes. I really wish I had started sooner. The only reason why I hadn't, and I think a lot of people can relate to this, is there, there's tons of people. They always say this, and it's funny. They poke fun at, at, at in, uh, the cartoon, The Family Guy with the dog. Um, uh, and you just say, I'm going to write this book someday. There's going to be this book. you got this idea in your head, and you just – you always kind of say, oh, I'm going to write this book. And for the longest time as a personal trainer, which I was a personal trainer for a cup of coffee, and at that time I really, you know, kept saying, oh, all this information I've got, I would love to just kind of put it into a book so then I could just hand it to my client and be like, read this, come back to me, and I'll start training you. Uh, it was kind of a joke at first, but eventually I was kind of like, man, I really do need to sit down and do that. But my thought was, because at that time, I started training in about 2006, and as you may know, it really didn't start blowing up. The ebook business hadn't started really expanding to like what about like 2008, 2009, and uh, I could be off on my date. So you know, please anybody that's out there, like, well, technically, you know, look, look, you know, so just go with me on this story, or or let uh, us or let us know in the comments, you know. Yes, let let us know in the comments, a absolutely. So uh, in any event. Um, 2006, I started doing the training, and I was doing that from about 2006 to 2010, 2011-ish at a chain gym in Columbus, and it was already kind of on my mind to create a book. It wasn't until I was actually out here in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was working at a assisted living community. We had what was called a wellness coach. All this wellness coach is just like, you're the easiest person to work with. You know, she never had to tell me you have to eat healthy. I'm She's like, do you eat healthy? I don't know what I can tell you to eat more of. Uh, right. <laughs> she was just kind of like, you know, so how's your workouts been? I'm like, great, awesome. And I tell her, you know, I, I, I do like 100 to 1,000 squats. She's like, oh, my gosh, you know. <laughs> I was just like, it's just a wrestler mentality where I would just, I would, you know, I continually try to improve myself physically speaking. So uh, she just, she started coming up with different things where she challenged me to meditate more, and then it came out that I liked writing, you know, and she's just like, well, you know, so what have you wrote? I'm like, well, I haven't wrote anything yet. And I kind of found myself when it came out, I'm like, oh, hell, <laughs> <laughs> she's going to use this against me. And sure enough, uh, that was one of my goals was she said, OK, why don't you write a book? And I'm like, yeah, I've always thought about that. Well, after the second time of her bringing up the whole book thing, I was like, you know, Fine. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I started getting up at 4 a.m. And we're talking, I got up at 4 a.m. for probably, I think, it had to have been about three months straight. And I would work for about an hour to two hours just wildly typing. Like, literally, I had no outline. 
all I did was I would just sit there and I would just talk about all the things involved in fitness and that eventually came out to what is now out on the market called the three keys to greater health and happiness. Now it wasn't called that originally, it was a different name, it was poorly edited, but the bottom line is I did finish it. I did put it out and when I put it out and made some money, that's when I was like, God, oh, this is awesome. So it was really my wellness coach who held me up to a higher standard and really kind of put the, the flame underneath my ass to say, Khan, you know, get going, let's do this. So it, it's always great to have somebody like that, somebody to cheer you on. And uh, if, you know, if you're ever a person who has a book within you, and you find that you're kind of hitting a sticking point, I would just say it's kind of like working out. Get yourself a partner, someone to hold you accountable. So that way they can come back and say, hey, how's that book going? You know, did you get 10 pages written over the last week? You know, that really helped me out a lot. So hugely, hugely thankful. And actually, I think I even thanked her in my first book. That's great. And, and that kind of actually leads perfectly into my next question. Awesome. Um, you, uh, you know, you mentioned your wellness coach uh, and, and Lance Storm, I believe, um, yeah. as, as mentors to you. Um, yeah. And also Jason Brock, if I remember correctly. Uh, would you point to any or could you point to any other people who have significantly helped or mentored you and uh, in, in how they were instrumental in your success? Oh, man. You got mentors and you got leaders around you all the time. And sometimes they come in the weirdest form. Uh, I, I would say that, geez, this is a tough question to answer. How about I do this? As I've told you the most positive ones, the ones you can look at and say, man, they're successful. And so I want to model that success. Uh, D. Juan Bainey is another great one. Uh, he actually interviewed me early on this year. And I'll tell you, man, I, I was thrilled to actually be able to talk to D. Juan. I was exposed to D. Juan Bainey through Jason Brock because he'd interviewed him the year prior. And I just started following D. Juan. I thought, man, this guy's the man. But why don't I just go ahead and I'm going to do it something a little different. So what I'll do is I'll tell you a different type of a mentor, a different type of a leader, a person that starts to teach you things. I work with this person, okay? I'm not gonna name any names. Right. She was a very foul person. She was not happy with her life. She hated her husband. She didn't like her job and it was very clear. And I had to work with this woman on a daily basis. I did not like being around her. I didn't like her attitude. I didn't like the way she treated people. And it got to the point where I even complained to my direct manager and I felt like it was going unanswered. Like it was like, well, that's kind of like the way she is. Why don't we sit down and we'll have a chat? I'm like, no, you know, you can't, you know, other than painting, you know, the reptile, you can't change the snake's skin. A snake will always be a snake, will always be a snake. And I'm going to a job to try to fulfill my obligation and make a living. But here I was, I was going to the job and I was miserable. Mm -hmm. I was just so unhappy because I would have to end up working with this person. But then when I started to realize, I'm like, wait a second, I really don't have to do this. And she was kind of a person that was put in my path, I believe, to show me what I should not do in life. Because I'm sure if I would have stayed into my job, I would have continued to be miserable. I would have chosen to be miserable and then eventually I would have ended up being like her. So she was a teacher, she was a mentor in it, different regards. It was a way that you probably shouldn't do it this way. You hear that quite a bit, some people you know, point out, you know, get a mentor, get a coach, get a teacher, but sometimes they're just, they're right around you. Every single opportunity that you have, every, even, you know, my exposure with you, Ben, that's going to be a learning experience. Not that it's going to be anything like this, this bad person that I used to work with. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, every single experience is, is just vital. You just have to be very receptive to it. That's the thing. Always learn. Always ask questions. Always be hungry to learn more. And just because something's bad doesn't mean it's not going to teach you something good. Right. Right. It's a great point. Um, so... So moving forward, you know, we kind of touched on your past. Uh, we kind of talked about where you are and, ha and how you got there and, you know, who helped you get there. Uh, what would you say moving forward is the one biggest thing that you would like to accomplish in your lifetime? 
Hmm. That's so tough to say. Uh, I've crossed off a lot of big goals. Uh, you know, making a significant income that can support my wife and I is huge, huge to me. Um, I would like to eventually get it to the point to where, hmm, man, you, you, that's a loaded question. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, man, I'm just going to speak off the cuff here. So hopefully nobody holds this to me, but I would like to eventually get it to the point to where I don't just make a good successful living, but I want to get it to where I can explore the world with my wife and not have to necessarily worry about the financial constraints. In other words, if I wanted to jump off this call, which I could technically do that right now, it wouldn't be a good idea. But as soon as I jumped <laughs> off this call, it would be nice if I said to my wife, you know what, let's go and let's go to Venice. And it wouldn't be an issue. Right. Could we do it right now? Yes. Could we afford it? Probably not. <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and the same is I want to be able to get it to where I can be able to financially handle most anything for travel because traveling with my wife is one of the most fun things for me. I love going and spending time with her. You know, we're going to be going to Puerto Rico here soon and that's going to be a first experience for the both of us and I can't wait. I'm ecstatic about it. So I want to have that option and that availability to do that. You know, you're going to get a lot of people that will say, well, I want to solve, you know, I want world peace. I want to solve hunger, things like that. Well, of course, everybody wants to have those type of humanitarian efforts. So, you know, adding that in there, you know, borrowing that, uh, putting that aside, essentially, I would like to eventually get it to where I can just travel the world unencumbered by any financial constraints. That's great. That's great. Um, so I, I have two more questions for you, if you don't mind. Sure. Hey, take your time. Um, so the first question is, if you could give one piece of advice that, that would serve as your legacy, what would it be? Hmm. One piece of advice that could serve as my legacy. Man, uh, this is great because this is probably going to be like a quote that's going to end up being put up somewhere. Either, <laughs> either someone's going to laugh at it or they're going to go with it. Whatever you do, make sure it makes you happy. Okay. Now, that's not at the expense of somebody else's happiness. Okay. But it's so important that you smile more, that you laugh more. And that you surround yourself with people with that same purpose. My cat just decided she's going to join this interview, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, be happy. Laugh a lot. Because the thing is, you never know if tomorrow is going to come to you. A lot of people live their lives like they think, oh, I, you know, tomorrow, yeah, I'm going to do that. You know, I'm going to be here. You know, they could think they're going to be living forever. They think they're immortal. You know, and the thing is, is you don't know if that's going to happen. So, you know, going back to the being miserable in your job, going every day, man, that sucked for me that I chose to be unhappy. And now that I know I can be happy any day I want to, this is, it's the most freedom that I can have. So that one bit of advice I can share with people is, man, be happy. Just two words. That's all you need is be happy. And it's going to be easier said than done for some of your listeners. You know, some people are like, I'm not happy. You know, I... I hate my husband or I hate my wife and my children, you know, cost me thousands of dollars per month. And well, you know, clearly I had the choice of an exit strategy at my job. But, you know, if you've got a wife and kids, you're not happy around or anything else like that, then there's something needs to change. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to leave your family, but you need to probably make some different decisions into some different internal choices. Um, so that is my legacy. If I were to have it on my tombstone, which hopefully there won't be any tombstones for me. I think that's just a waste of, you know, valuable earth space. Donate me to science. But uh, <laughs> if I were to have on my, you know, my virtual tombstone, it would be at least he was happy. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. And um, for the last question, I just want to ask, is there anything that you think is an important part of who you are or an important part of your story that I didn't ask you about today? You asked a lot of really good lit questions. It's so funny. I, I almost, anytime I get interviewed, I wait for that, that one question, which is how much are you making per month? What was your best month? 
And uh, it's so funny, and you're going to probably see this on self-publishing with Dale L. Roberts over on my YouTube channel uh, eventually. But, you know, and I'm sorry if this is, this is going to be slightly vulgar, Ben. Please forgive me and anybody that listens to this. Talking about your income, it's like working and you got somebody who's sitting by the water cooler bragging about their price per hour. It's like a dick measuring contest. You know, uh, I'm sure there's some people like, I don't say it to brag. Well, why are you saying it? You know, don't, don't share with me your stuff. And, you know, and it's, it's just, it just amazes me. You know, I did $30,000 per month and yada, yada. Well, whoop de do. You could be making so much money per month. And if you're, you're making this much money per month, can I ask you a question is, how happy are you? How wealthy are you truly in spirit? Are you very rich or do you just have like a really large bank account? Because that doesn't make a damn difference to me. There's lots of millionaires and billionaires out there that are miserable sons of guns. But I'll tell you this much, man. I am more wealthy than any one of them put together because the fact that I don't need a dollar sign per month that I did. Oh, yeah, I'm saying it to, you know, come on, man. You know, it's, it, it all comes down to this whole, you know, thing of just, you know, let's see. Let's everybody just flop their thing out. And let's go ahead and measure, you know, each one of our sizes. Does it really matter at the end of the day? You know, are you really thinking you're inspiring somebody by sharing the fact that you made $30,000, $60,000 and yada, yada? I would say to the person that says to me, you know what? I'm successful. Why are you successful? Tell me those measurable things that doesn't include a dollar sign. That's going to inspire me. That right there just gives me goosebumps. You know, people that, you know, get to realize life goals that are outside of the financial constraints. That right there is amazing to me. So kudos to you that you didn't bring up that question because, you know, I would have probably ended up shooting that one down because it just kills me. And uh, we'd, uh, I had uh, a podcast with my friend Kevin called Bootstrap Businessman. We had interviewed Dewan, And before we got on with Dewan, Dewan's just like, I got one request, guys. Sure, fire away. He's like, could you not ask like the, uh, the financial situation? I'm like, wasn't going to touch it. <laughs> so right. we were in the same boat on that one. And uh, it was so wonderful. So yeah, you've done a great job. I, I really think that you've covered a lot of things, man. It's been a lot of fun. I don't know if there's anything else I can be able to help you out as far as uh, any kind of questions I can cover. I'm more than happy to, and it's obviously been really awesome. Yeah, well, um, you know, I, I guess if uh, if we think of more questions or, uh, you know, the listeners have any more questions, we can always maybe do a follow-up interview later on down the road. I'd be happy to. Yeah, it's, it's always a blast. And if there's anything I, I could ever do, please reach out to me, guys. I, I think, Ben, you, you can probably be testimonial that I'm very approachable and I keep myself somewhat available. So you can always look for me on Facebook, uh, Dale L. Roberts. Uh, it's very simple to find me. I've, I've got like a picture of me shrugging, I think, like weights or something like that. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, everybody, this is Dale L. Roberts from Columbus, Ohio. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a great day.